My name is Julie. I currently work with my husband, Scott, at his family's small business. This business is managed by my father-in-law, Paul. It's a cozy place with about five employees. Paul doesn't get involved much in the daily work. Instead, Scott, who will soon take over as president, works hard. He looks for new clients and projects, showing his dedication to growing the business. When we have a big project, all the employees come together enthusiastically, creating a vibrant atmosphere. I have been working here for 12 years since I got married. Hey Julie, how long do you plan on clinging to our family business? My mother-in-law, Olivia, asked this as I came home early to make dinner, while Scott was still at the office. Olivia had retired from the business when Scott and I got married and seemed happy about her retirement. But now, with more free time, she often criticized me. What do you mean by clinging? I asked, trying to stay calm. Olivia sharply replied, exactly what it sounds like. You must have married Scott because you couldn't find a job anywhere else, and now you're just taking advantage of our company. I sighed to myself. These kinds of comments from her were becoming more common. When I married, I left my previous job and joined Scott's family business by choice, not because I was fired. For some reason, Olivia thought I was completely unskilled at my job. I said before that it's not that I couldn't work somewhere else. I chose to join Scott's company, I told her. But she answered dismissively, I can see right through your real intentions. She thought she knew everything about me and walked back to the living room. However, the problems with my mother-in-law weren't just her words. She had quit her job promising to look after the house, but she never helped out. My father-in-law often asked her to do some chores since she was home all day, but she stubbornly refused, saying, I've worked all my life, now it's the daughter-in-law's turn to do the housework. As a result, I usually ended up making dinner. Olivia seemed to make and eat her own lunch as she liked, but she never cleaned up afterward. Each day, as I returned for my errands, the sight of piled-up plates and utensils greeted me, stirring a mix of frustration and resignation within me. Gathering my courage, I decided to address this domestic issue one sunny afternoon. Olivia, I began hesitantly, trying to sound as diplomatic as possible. I've noticed the dishes often get left in the sink. It would be really helpful if you could tidy up after your meals. It's just a small request, but it would mean a lot to me. To my dismay, Olivia's response was far from understanding. Her eyes flashed with anger as she snapped. Are you trying to give me orders in my own house? You're just a daughter-in-law. How dare you dictate what I should do? Her sharp and unyielding words reminded me of the delicate balance in our family dynamics. I wish Helen were here instead of you, Olivia continued, her voice laced with a mix of longing and bitterness. Helen, Scott's younger sister and my sister-in-law, was a spirited and ambitious woman. Our encounters had been limited to brief formal meetings, and she was notably absent from our wedding, having canceled at the last minute. I later learned from Scott that she had overindulged with friends the night before and was nursing a hangover, unable to attend. Despite this, Helen pursued her dreams fiercely, relocating to Jersey after her college graduation to dive into the bustling world of fashion design. In an attempt to change the subject, I mentioned Helen's hard work and dedication. Helen's really making a name for herself in Jersey, working hard in her field, I said, hoping to ease the tension. However, Olivia's views on Jersey were negative. Jersey, that cold, impersonal city. It's no place for someone as warm-hearted as Helen. And you, you're from Jersey too, aren't you? Now it all makes sense. You're always so distant towards me. Caught in this tiring conversation, I realized that if I didn't start preparing dinner soon, we'd be eating much later than usual. While dealing with my own frustrations, I managed to stay calm. Mom, let's continue this conversation later. I need to focus on getting dinner ready or we'll be eating quite late tonight. With some reluctance, Olivia finally went back to the living room, leaving me alone with my thoughts and the noise of the cooking utensils. 
Paul and Scott were both aware of Olivia's mistreatment towards me as a daughter-in-law and tried to intervene whenever they saw it happening. However, their efforts seemed to have little effect. Each time they confronted the situation, their faces showed concern and frustration, showing their desire to create harmony in our family. Ironically, whenever Paul and Scott scolded Olivia for her behavior, she took out her anger on me, becoming even more hostile and sharp with her words. Her face, usually kind and gentle, became twisted with disdain, her tone cutting deeper than before. Although I had never been physically hurt, the emotional impact of Olivia's words was significant. Paul and Scott's support had been my comfort, helping me somewhat ignore Olivia's harsh words until then. One morning, just after I had finished cleaning up from breakfast and was preparing to leave for work, something unimaginable happened. In the midst of the morning rush, as I was hurrying, Olivia suddenly exclaimed, Oh my, what a mess! And without warning, she poured a bucket of water over my handbag. I was stunned, a mix of shock and anger making me speechless. What are you doing, Olivia? I managed to ask, my voice trembling with disbelief. Olivia's response was dismissive, her tone like that of a mischievous child. Oh, was that your stuff? I thought it was just a big piece of trash, she said dismissively, which made me even angrier. Even if you thought it was trash, who pours water on it? What kind of thinking is that? Now the carpet is all wet. Why would you do something like this? I was really upset as I quickly took the wet things out of my bag, including important work documents, and laid them on the table. Olivia looked calm and didn't seem sorry or worried about how upset I was. Because you don't need to go to work anymore, she said coolly. I was shocked. In our living room, filled with morning light, I sat across from Olivia. Her face was colder and more determined than usual. It was as if she had made a decision that would change everything. Excuse me. I said, confused and surprised. You've been in this house for 12 years, but now I can finally get rid of you, she declared. Her words hurt me deeply, and her voice had a level of anger and determination I had never heard before. My mind spun and my heart ached. Getting rid of me, I asked unable to believe what I was hearing. Her words made me feel like an outsider in this family. Actually, my daughter is joining the company, so we need you to leave. Today's your last day. All you have to do is bow your head to your father-in-law and Scott, apologizing for all the trouble you've caused, she said with a mocking laugh. She was using my job to push me out. I had spent years at that job, earning respect and making memories. I was shocked and hurt. My devotion to this family seemed to mean nothing to her. It horrified me not just that she acted this way, but that after 12 years of hard work, she could ask me to leave so her daughter could take my place. It felt like my years of effort were being disregarded. Really? Are you sure about this? Wasn't Helen working in a clothing store in Jersey? I asked, reflecting my confusion and worry. My job was more than just a paycheck. It was my way of fulfilling myself. Meanwhile, Helen, my sister-in-law, seemed to have grown tired of city life and decided to come back to the family. She said she was tired of the unfriendly people in Jersey, so I told her if she came back home, I'd have a job ready for her. She agreed to return immediately. Now that she's coming back, I want you out of this house, she told me. I couldn't believe her words. She was ready to turn my life upside down with just one decision, completely ignoring my role in the family and not even listening to me. She handed me an envelope, saying, I've written your resignation letter, and just like that, she kicked me out. My heart broke. Everything I had built over the years seemed worthless, treated like just a piece of paper. Her actions deeply hurt our family bond. I walked to the company, just a quick five-minute walk from my house. As I walked under the cool morning sky, each step was heavy with the weight of what was happening. When I told my father-in-law, Paul, and my husband, Scott, about what my mother-in-law had said, they were shocked but stayed calm. They suggested that maybe it was time for me to resign to show her the reality of the situation. 
This idea upset me deeply. I had worked hard in our family business for years and barely knew what a long vacation was like, aside from short breaks during Thanksgiving and the holiday season. Encouraged by Scott and Paul's kind words, why don't you spread your wings for a change? I decided to go on a little trip. As I packed, I thought a lot about my life, my choices, and what was ahead. Meanwhile, my sister-in-law Helen, who was supposed to replace me at the company, shockingly didn't show up until 3 o'clock p.m. Her lack of responsibility disappointed Scott and Paul, who had been managing without me. Helen seemed not interested in learning the work despite their efforts to teach her. Hearing this made me worry about the future of our company, even as I looked forward to my trip. Leaving without seeing my mother-in-law, I quickly started my journey. During the trip, as I enjoyed the view from the train, I reflected on my life past, present, and future and savored local seafood delicacies. I thought deeply about myself, my family, and our business. But on the five days of my trip, the peace was broken when Helen called me crying. What's going on? I asked. Mom said it was an easy job, just sitting in a chair, but Scott and Dad are acting like I can't do anything right, she said. Her words, likely influenced by my mother-in-law, surprised me even as I was enjoying my break. I decided it was time to address the situation. So Helen, how good are you with computers? I asked her. Hesitantly, she replied, well, I usually watch videos online and, oh, I play games too. This question was to see if Helen could adjust to a new job. Having worked in a clothing store in Jersey for a while, her computer skills seemed basic. Do you know how to use Word or Excel? I asked. Helen looked confused, showing she wasn't familiar with these tools in a professional setting. Even in clothing stores, tasks like managing sales data in Excel or recording customer info in Word are common. Have you ever worked with image editing, video editing, or audio editing software? Do you have any experience with such tools? I asked. Helen, clearly puzzled, replied, what's all that? This question aimed to dig deeper into her technical skills to better understand her capabilities. Considering her background in the apparel industry, it's unlikely she never used a computer. Tasks like tracking sales, managing inventory, and inputting customer data would have required her to use Excel. When asked if she can handle calculations for sales or fill in documents, she confidently said, I can do that. However, when I asked if she could also calculate tax, her confidence faded, and she answered uncertainly, uh? This question tested her math skills and her ability to use them in a business context. While Helen might have other skills, it was clear she was insecure about the necessary skills for the job. Her discomfort seemed mainly due to her struggle with calculations, which could explain why she faced criticism from Paul and Scott. First and foremost, I needed to show my mother-in-law and those who tried to push me out that they were mistaken. Since you're taking over my job, I began. I told Helen that she needed to handle the accounting tasks well and remember to be professional in her emails because a casual tone that might be fine with friends doesn't work for business. She would also be in charge of scheduling the staff shifts. Even though our team is small, we carefully consider everyone's time off requests, so she shouldn't just think about what's convenient for her. As I listed these expectations, I could hear her sobbing on the other end of the phone. But I was told I wouldn't have to do anything. Why are there so many tasks? I didn't come back home for this, she said, and then abruptly ended the call. Over the next four days, I decided to enjoy sightseeing in Jersey, the place Helen had left. My time there showed me that not everyone in Jersey is unfriendly actually. Finding someone as cold-hearted as my mother-in-law and Helen seemed rare. A week after I left my job, I returned to my in-law's house. When I arrived, Olivia, looking very upset, confronted me angrily. You, how dare you make my daughter cry? You won't get away with this, she yelled, her eyes full of anger and misunderstanding. She tried to grab me, but Scott and Paul quickly stepped in to calm her down. 
though her anger didn't seem to lessen. Scott sighed deeply before saying, Helen is upset because she was scolded for trying to boss her employees around despite not being able to do the job right. It's not Julie's fault. Besides, Julie hasn't been here for a week, so she couldn't have upset Helen. Mom, you really need to stop these groundless accusations. But Olivia kept blaming me. It's because of her. This woman is the reason for Helen's trouble, she claimed, her voice emotional and filled with baseless suspicions. Where is Helen, by the way? I asked, looking around the living room, but Helen was nowhere to be seen. Her absence added more confusion to an already puzzling situation. While it didn't matter to me that Olivia was upset about Helen, I knew Helen didn't have many options since she had ended her lease at her apartment in Jersey. I thought Helen would be at her parents' house, but she wasn't there, which made me wonder. Helen's locked herself in her room. She's been crying and saying she doesn't want to go to work anymore, Scott explained. It seemed like Helen had avoided learning the job properly. It was understandable, though, because she didn't have the skills needed to replace me. You've been turning Scott and Paul against me, haven't you? Otherwise, they wouldn't say the company ran better with you than with Helen, who can't do the job. Olivia accused me sharply. Her words were filled with long-standing misunderstandings and prejudices, leaving me completely baffled. She seemed to have always seen me as an opponent, her words reflecting years of wrong ideas. Scott let out a heavy sigh, his face showing his tiredness and frustration with the complicated emotions in our family. He had tried many times to clear up the misunderstandings among family members, but it didn't seem to work very well. Mom, I know it might sound odd coming from me, but Julie is truly exceptional at her work. She's certified in bookkeeping and her secretarial skills are top-notch. Moreover, she's studied Spanish and even has experience studying abroad. When it comes to dealing with multiple languages at our company, Julie handles everything, Scott said with a sense of pride. His mother, Olivia, looked very surprised. She had assumed that I quit my job as soon as I joined the family, so she had no idea about my contributions and achievements at work. What? That sounds like something straight out of a TV drama, I thought, recalling my college days. I was so focused on getting various certifications that I immersed myself in my studies, so much that I barely had time for clubs or a romantic relationship. It was during this busy time that I met Scott, who came to my company for business. As I found myself sharing the story of how Scott and I first met, I realized that this wasn't what Olivia wanted to hear. So I quickly got back to the main point. In short, I was responsible for a lot of tasks at the company, from handling accounting to scheduling, working with other companies, and managing employee shifts. Thanks to that, I could reach out to other businesses for deals, making the work environment much more comfortable than when Olivia was around. Scott added this, leaving Olivia speechless in amazement. Just then, Paul, Scott's father, made a comment that surprised me. We're going to shut down the company soon, actually. Helen made a big mistake. Even though she was supposed to prepare some documents, she decided to handle phone calls because it seemed more fun. While Scott and I were away, she ended up being rude to the person in charge from another company. Of course, I got a call to confirm this. Hearing this, I was so shocked that I instinctively covered my mouth with my hand. I can't believe Helen would do something like that, I murmured, filled with disbelief. The thought that Helen's actions might lead to the downfall of our company went through my mind, filling me with dread. However, as I was lost in these anxious thoughts, the story took an unexpected turn. When I explained the situation, they suggested it might be time to end the family business. We had mentioned this to you before, right? About being absorbed by another company, they said. Then, the president of company is stepped forward, saying he was interested if Julie and I were involved. This was an unexpected but long-hoped-for development. Running a family business has its limits and it's uncertain whether we could consistently attract stable customers. That's why Scott had always worked hard in sales, 
trying to secure new clients. Being absorbed by a larger company could mean having a steady base of customers. The future, once uncertain, suddenly seemed to have a bit of hope. However, this news only brought relief to me, Scott and his father. Scott's mother suddenly opposed the idea, saying, that's not acceptable. Scott must become the president. This company is ours, isn't it? I was surprised by this sudden change. It seemed that more than a stable future, Olivia was concerned about maintaining the prestige of being part of a company president's family. And you're telling me he's not going to be the president anymore? Absolutely not acceptable, Olivia exclaimed passionately. This commotion caught the interest of Helen, who was upstairs in her room, leading her to come down to the living room to see what was happening. In response to the chaos started by Olivia, Paul spoke up calmly but firmly, I am divorcing you, so either way, you will no longer be part of this executive family. Not only have you not changed your attitude towards my son's wife, but you also neglect household chores. To top it off, you spend your days out with young men instead of being home. I have no intention of supporting such a wife any longer. This was news to both me and Scott. We were so shocked that we could only stare at Paul with wide eyes. It seemed he had planned to discuss divorce from the beginning, as he took out divorce papers and a photo of Olivia with a young man from the living room shelf, placing them on the table. If you sign the divorce papers now and leave with your belongings, I won't ask for alimony. I know getting any money from you would be pointless anyway, Paul said. So unfair, how can you say that? Haven't I been devoted to this house all these years? Olivia protested. Devoted to this house? Have you done any real housework in the last 12 years? Does spending someone else's money on young men count as devotion to the house? Paul countered. It was the first time we saw him this angry. Seeing this, Helen, who had come down to the living room, was visibly shaking from shock. Helen, you're part of this too. You came back home because you couldn't make it in Jersey, and now you can't find a job but still act superior. In the end, you stopped working entirely. Who did you inherit this escapism from? It's time for you to leave this house too, he continued. Next, we saw Helen's shock and resistance. She believed she was an important member of the family, but the reality was different. Wait a minute, Dad. Mom might be a lost cause, but I'm your precious daughter, right? She said. The family conflict deepened as Helen tried to assert her place, revealing her betrayal towards her mother. Helen, are you betraying me now? Olivia exclaimed, feeling betrayed by her daughter at the last moment. However, as the two started to argue loudly, Paul sternly silenced them with a shout. If I just kick you out, it'll cause trouble for everyone, so I've asked an acquaintance to take you in. They'll be here soon to pick you up. Get your minimum belongings ready. Left with no choice, Olivia and Helen began packing their belongings. Then, an acquaintance of Paul arrived to take Olivia and Helen away. The person who came to pick them up was running a factory with dormitories, and it seemed they would be working there. Meanwhile, Scott, Paul, and I talked to the employees about the company being absorbed and prepared for the busy days ahead for our future. Finally, I found out I was pregnant. When I told the president of Company A, he was delighted and promised to send someone to replace me, which was a huge relief. Currently, Scott and Paul are working even harder for the sake of our upcoming child. One day, I found myself in a situation I could have never imagined. It all started when I took my husband to the doctor for a regular checkup. What was supposed to be a routine visit turned my world upside down. Dr. Lawrence, with a grave expression, shared some shocking news about my husband. The severity in his eyes told me this was no joke. I felt a wave of panic and disbelief wash over me. My husband, who I had cared for through his illness, was now a source of fear and concern. Doctor! Lawrence urged me to consider my safety, suggesting I might need to distance myself from my husband. His words left me feeling overwhelmed and scared. My name is Betty Friedan and I'm a 50-year-old who has dedicated 10 years to working at a leading pharmaceutical company. That place has become my second home. 
offering comfort and a sense of belonging. Despite my age, I've continued to work full-time, earning the respect and admiration of my colleagues. Not many people my age are still working as I do, but I've never minded. My dedication to my job was partly because I remained single until four years ago. My manager, Gerald, and I shared a close bond, partly because we were both single. He once jokingly asked if I was ever going to get married, a comment that could have been taken the wrong way, but I knew it was all in good humor. Around that time, I was secretly seeing Richard, who would later become my husband. Richard was a bit older, previously married and divorced, and like me, wasn't interested in having children. We met through a marriage consultation service, seeking companionship for our later years. Choosing to keep our relationship private, we didn't share our plans with anyone, even as our manager made light-hearted jabs about marriage. Eventually, Richard and I tied the knot quietly without a ceremony, simply signing the necessary paperwork at City Hall. The simplicity of the process surprised me, but I was excited for our future together. But now, faced with Dr. Lawrence's alarming advice, I was forced to reassess everything. My feelings of compassion for my sick husband were now tangled with fear and uncertainty. Dr. Lawrence's words echoed in my mind, urging me to take action for my own safety. As I stood there trying to process the situation, I realized I needed to make a decision, and fast. The life I had known and the future I had envisioned were suddenly on uncertain ground. I'm La, and my husband Richard works at a factory. To be honest, I earn more than he does. Richard started his job there right after finishing high school. As for me, I grew up in an orphanage and always dreamt of being independent. That's why I didn't want to quit my job at the pharmaceutical company even after we got married. I loved my job too much. When Richard and I tied the knot, I immediately told my manager, Gerald, about it. He congratulated me, but I could tell he had mixed feelings. Maybe he felt a bit lonely because I, his buddy in singleness, got married first. I tried teasing him about it, but he brushed it off, so I let the matter drop. Despite Gerald's reaction, I was over the moon about starting a new chapter with Richard. I imagined all the wonderful things our future would hold, but reality turned out to be less shiny than my dreams. Life as newlyweds was pretty standard. Not much changed for me, I kept working, and the biggest change was probably moving to a more rural area and commuting by car instead of bus. Richard and I shared my old car because he didn't have one. About a year into our marriage, though, things started to get rocky. Richard began showing signs of depression. He seemed off, hardly eating his breakfast, getting lost in his thoughts, and even getting small things like condiments mixed up. His clothes didn't match, and he became quieter at work and at home. Although I've always appreciated Richard's quiet strength, his silence became too heavy, making it feel like I was living alone. This loneliness crept up on me as I noticed these small but significant changes in him. It dawned on me that Richard might be dealing with a mental health issue. Watching someone you care about struggle without knowing how to help is incredibly hard. I decided to take Richard to a clinic that specializes in mind and body health, where he was diagnosed with depression. I had a basic understanding of depression, but hearing the diagnosis made my world feel a bit dimmer. The doctor explained that the best way to tackle depression is to address its root cause directly. However, pinpointing the exact reason for Richard's depression was challenging. He had been working at the same factory for years without any issues, and nothing significant had changed in his job. If anything, I worried that perhaps our marriage had somehow contributed to his state. During our conversations with the doctor, I assured him that we were living a content life and couldn't identify any direct pressures at home that might have led to Richard's condition. The doctor encouraged us to return if we noticed any changes or had any insights into potential causes of his depression. Despite multiple visits to the clinic, we couldn't find the root cause of Richard's distress. Over time, his depression only deepened. On his worst days, Richard would barely get out of bed, plagued by headaches or calling in sick to work. His appetite vanished, and he lost a noticeable amount of weight. Eventually, he was unable to continue working and had to leave his job. Richard felt terribly guilty for putting all the financial burden on me, but I reassured him that I was okay with working. My primary concern was his well-being. 
It was tough to see him so affected and I constantly worried about him, especially when I was at work. There was an incident where he went out and couldn't find his way back home, which made me fear he was battling not just depression but potentially dementia as well. This possibility added to my stress. When colleagues asked about how things were going, I had to admit that Richard wasn't improving. Seeing someone you love struggle so much without a clear way to help is incredibly difficult. Gerald noticed I was looking particularly worn out one day and handed me an energy drink. Drinking it made me feel a little better, and I was touched by his gesture of support. He reminded me that we're all in this journey together, and his words nearly brought me to tears. With everything going on with Richard, I hadn't realized how much stress I'd been piling up on myself. It became clear that I needed to keep myself together, or else I might break down too. So, I threw myself into work, trying to maintain some normalcy in our lives. One years have flown by, and things with Richard haven't improved. In fact, they've only gotten worse. As our third wedding anniversary approached, I couldn't see any light at the end of the tunnel for his condition. Then, one morning, I noticed our car wasn't where it should have been. Confused, I checked again, but the car was definitely missing. Since Richard's diagnosis, I was the only one who drove it. I hadn't used the car since the day before, which meant it should have been at home. Concerned, I asked Richard if he knew anything about where the car might be. He casually mentioned he thought it was there when he got home yesterday. I remembered he had gone out for a bit while I was at work. The doctor had suggested he try walking or jogging to help him cope. If the car was there when he returned, it must have disappeared sometime during the night. With the car gone, I had no choice but to use public transport, which made me about 10 minutes late for work. I explained the situation to Gerald, who was understanding but puzzled about the car's whereabouts. He wondered if Richard might have taken it, but I dismissed the idea. Given Richard's condition and his aversion to driving since falling ill, it didn't make sense. Despite Richard's occasional lapses in memory and frequent mood swings, I couldn't imagine him being responsible for the missing car. The mystery of the car added yet another layer of complexity to our already challenging situation. Right after realizing the car was gone, I didn't waste any time reporting it to the police, hoping it would turn up soon. But deep down, a nagging worry haunted me that it might be gone for good. As if that wasn't enough, something else strange occurred. On the day I was supposed to get my paycheck, I went to the bank to take out some money and noticed that my personal bank account was empty. I was taken aback. We do have a shared account, which I checked next, only to find it was also at zero. This left me completely baffled. Richard and I shared the joint account, but he had no access to my personal account, nor did he know its PIN. Yet, somehow, all our savings had vanished. The cold wave of shock hit me hard, and once home, I confronted Richard. I asked him if he knew anything about the missing funds from our joint account. He seemed genuinely confused and denied knowing anything about it. Considering his state of mind due to depression, I hesitated to press further, fearing it might add to his stress. Richard, with his gaze fixed on the ceiling, seemed distant, lost in one of his frequent dazes attributed to his condition. It made me wonder if he could have actually taken the money. Planning to bring this issue up with the police, I was overwhelmed by the double blow of losing both our car and our savings. The financial pinch was sharp, made worse by my lack of a family safety net, having grown up in an orphanage with no parents to turn to for help. Amidst these troubles, it was suggested that we switch Richard to a larger hospital with more resources than the small community psychiatric clinic we'd been using. The clinic had reached its limits in what it could do for him and recommended a general hospital for better care. They even provided a referral letter. So, we decided to make our first visit to the general hospital, taking a taxi there. The experience was new and a bit daunting for me, and throughout the journey, Richard remained quiet, lost in his own thoughts as we arrived at the hospital. Taking a deep breath, I walked into the hospital, handing over the referral letter at the reception and bracing myself for a bit of a wait. Given it was a bustling general hospital, the lobby was crowded with patients, each waiting for their turn. After around an hour, Richard was finally called in for his consultation. While he went inside, I took out a book to pass the time, but barely had Richard entered the doctor's office when a nurse approached me. Excuse me, are you Mrs. Simmons? She asked. 
I confirmed, and she mentioned the doctor wanted to see me. I was used to discussing Richard's condition, so I assumed it was a similar situation this time and followed her, albeit with a bit of anxiety. The nurse led me to a different room, where I was greeted by a doctor who looked about a decade my senior with graying hair and a kind demeanor. Before I could even settle in, I asked if this was about Richard's condition. He nodded gravely and I prepared myself for potentially bad news. The doctor's next words took me completely by surprise, however. He urged me to distance myself from my husband, revealing that Richard had been arrested for fraud ten years ago. My mind spun with confusion. Why was this coming up now during a routine medical visit? The doctor explained his suspicions about Richard's depression, suggesting that he might be pretending. He recounted recognizing Richard from a surgery ten years ago, where he had treated a deep cut on Richard's leg. The revelation was jarring. Here I was thinking we were addressing Richard's mental health, only to discover his hidden past and the possible deception about his current state. This unexpected turn of events left me reeling, trying to reconcile the caring husband I knew with the person the doctor described. When the doctor mentioned recognizing a large scar on Richard's right leg, everything started to make sense. I knew of the scar but never knew its origin, as Richard had never mentioned it. Learning that the doctor before me was the one who had treated Richard's injury years ago felt like an unbelievable twist of fate. The story unfolded further when the doctor revealed that Richard had injured himself during a dispute with his former wife, a dispute that arose because he had swindled her. He had stolen her luxury items and money. Shockingly, he had also feigned dementia during that time, manipulating his wife into lowering her guard before committing the fraud. This pattern of pretending to be ill to facilitate his deceit was appalling. Hearing about Richard's criminal past and his arrest was staggering. I hadn't looked into Richard's background before marrying him. Being alone most of my life, I was just happy to find someone willing to be my partner. The doctor's stern warning that Richard could be a danger to me sent chills down my spine. There was a seriousness in his tone that made it clear this was no laughing matter. The realization hit me hard I had been deceived. In the days that followed, I struggled to act normal around Richard while secretly planning my next steps. I decided to set up surveillance cameras around our home to watch Richard's activities when I wasn't there. About a week later, I noticed a missing watch and bag. Reviewing the camera footage, I saw Richard leave the house with them and return later with a wad of cash, looking suspiciously pleased with himself. His demeanor did not match that of someone suffering from depression. This footage confirmed my worst fears. Richard was behind the theft of my belongings, the car, and our savings. Facing the hard evidence of his deceit was crushing. Richard had lied to and manipulated me, betraying the trust I had placed in him. It was clear that I needed to take significant action against someone who had pretended to be vulnerable and in need of care, only to exploit my compassion and generosity. The realization that Richard had betrayed my trust was unbearable. I had dedicated my life to working and caring for what I thought was a sick partner. A mere divorce felt too insignificant a response to the depth of deception I had endured. It was clear we needed to part ways, but I wanted more than just a separation. I wanted Richard to truly understand the gravity of his actions and to make amends for the harm he had caused. With a heavy heart and tears threatening to spill, I gathered the divorce papers and meticulously filled them out with all the necessary details. The following day, pretending everything was normal, I informed Richard I'd be stepping out briefly. I had already taken a day off from work, explaining the urgency of my situation to my employer, who had agreed to my sudden leave. At the police station, I presented my case, showing the officers the footage I had captured of Richard's deceit. Initially, they were hesitant to proceed based solely on the video. However, after verifying with the pawn shop, where Richard had sold the stolen items and locating my car being sold as a used vehicle, the evidence against him began to mount. It was also confirmed that he had unlawly accessed my bank accounts, and suspicions about his feigned depression were raised. As the truth unraveled, I was overwhelmed by a complex mix of relief and sorrow. The police decided to act swiftly, given Richard's criminal history, and prepared to arrest him. Returning home with the officers in the early afternoon, I found Richard at home, 
visibly startled by my unexpected presence and the sight of the police. Despite the divorce papers in my hand, his attention was fixed on the officers as one of them declared his arrest for fraud. Richard protested, claiming his depression as a defense. But I knew better. The doctor from the general hospital had already shed light on the likelihood of his deceit regarding his mental health condition. In that moment facing both the legal consequences of his actions and the end of our marriage, Richard's facade began to crumble. The decision to take this course of action was difficult, but necessary to protect myself and seek justice for the betrayal and manipulation I had endured. On my recent visit to the hospital, a doctor recognized Richard from his past actions. He shared that Richard had once feigned dementia to trick his former wife and expressed doubts about Richard's current claims of depression. Despite these serious accusations, Richard remained unshaken in front of the police, dismissively denying everything. It was as if his history of deceit had prepared him for this moment, showing no sign of guilt or remorse. Richard challenged us, demanding proof of his fraudulent actions. His boldness was baffling especially with the police right there, ready to arrest him based on solid evidence. It was a clear indication of his habitual manipulation and his underestimation of the situation's seriousness. For four years he had lied to me, taking advantage of my trust to steal from me and misuse my goodwill. Yet, in a twisted turn of blame, Richard suggested it was my fault for being too trusting, insulting me further. His audacity was astounding. I had supported him hoping for his recovery, only to be repaid with betrayal and scorn. In that moment, my patience vanished. I declared my intention to seek legal advice and pursue alimony, urging him to face the consequences of his actions at the police station. My outburst surprised even the officers, but it seemed to shake Richard's composure finally. As the police handcuffed him, Richard's defiance crumbled. He looked defeated, his arrogance replaced with frustration as he was led away. Watching the scene, I felt detached, as if observing someone else's life unraveling. Since the doctor's warning, nothing seemed real anymore. Yet, here I was, facing the harsh truth of my situation, determined to move forward from the chaos Richard had created. Watching Richard being led away by the police felt surreal, almost like a scene from a dream. This moment marked a turning point, allowing me to envision a return to my life before the chaos of marriage engulfed it. Though a sense of relief washed over me knowing I wouldn't spend my future under Richard's manipulative control, a wave of loneliness followed. Having waited more than 47 years to marry, the prospect of solitude once again cast a shadow over my newfound freedom. Two months later, our divorce was finalized. The process had been slightly delayed due to Richard's arrest. But by the time everything was official, my emotions had settled, enabling me to reflect on our shared history with a clear mind. Richard's future was uncertain, facing imprisonment for his second offense. I could only hope this experience would lead him to sincerely reconsider his choices. In the wake of our marriage, which had dissolved into nothing more than a disillusioning memory, I found myself pondering my next steps over a simple lunch at work. It was then that my boss, Gerald approached with a casual yet loaded comment as he joined me with his store-bought hot dog lunch. I think you'd be just fine if you were with me, he remarked, almost offhandedly. His words caught me off guard and it took a moment for their full weight to sink in, leaving me momentarily flustered. Yes, I'm serious, he added, seeing my hesitation, his tone smooth yet sincere. I was speechless my lunch momentarily forgotten as I processed his proposition. Gerald then returned to work, leaving me to contemplate his unexpected offer in a daze. The idea of a romantic relationship with Gerald had never crossed my mind. Yet I couldn't deny the care and stability he had always shown me. His steady presence and responsible nature suddenly cast him in a new light, despite my initial reaction to evaluate such matters. As I continued eating, the seeds of possibility Gerald had planted began to take root, suggesting a future I hadn't dared to imagine until now. The thought of inviting Gerald out for a meal after work sparked a warmth within me, kindling a sense of hope for the future. Perhaps this was the perfect moment to embark on a new journey, to explore the possibility of happiness and companionship once again. The idea of stepping out of my comfort zone and into a new beginning with someone who had shown me kindness and support 
felt both thrilling and comforting. Tonight, I decided, could be the start of something new and beautiful. Families often have conflicts or financial problems, but there are also families who manage to stick together and make it through everyday life. It's pretty clear which one is happier, don't you think? My name is Rachel. I've been called an oddball since I was a child. I don't know what's different about me. I just know people say I'm different. Being called different isn't the problem. The real issue is being ignored by my own parents. This led to a lonely childhood for me. I've always been sensitive to people's emotions and can somehow understand what they're thinking. I don't know why I can do this. It's not like I can always see or feel it, but it's as natural to me as moving my hand or breathing. I found it strange and couldn't understand why others couldn't do the same. There was a time when I felt a bad vibe from a colleague my father brought home from work. I warned my mother to be careful with that person, but she didn't listen. Later on, that colleague tricked my father into signing a contract as a guarantor for a loan. Although my mother didn't take my advice, when my father stepped away from the table with his colleague, I told him, Dad, something is telling me that the word joint is dangerous. I don't know what joint means, but please be careful. So, my father hesitated and refused to sign as a joint guarantor. Thanks to that, when my colleague went bankrupt and couldn't repay the debt, my father was able to avoid taking on all the debt. Another day, when I was shopping with my mother, I felt a wave of discomfort coming from behind us. When I turned around, I felt this bad feeling coming from a man wearing sunglasses and a hat. I said, Mom, let's take that side street. I grabbed my mother's hand and moved to the side street. My mother was confused and asked what was wrong, but just as we moved, we heard someone shout, Thief, from the street we had been on. The man with the bad vibe had snatched a woman's purse and ran off. The woman fell and got hurt badly. If we hadn't moved to the side street, the man's target would have been my mother. Things like this happened often, and people started to think I was strange and mysterious. My parents began to avoid me, and I felt lonely and isolated. What seemed normal to me was not normal to others. I started keeping my thoughts to myself. I stopped expressing my feelings because I knew normal people don't feel what I feel. If I didn't say anything, they wouldn't think I was weird. I would just be like a normal kid. I have a sister, Julie, who's four years younger than me. Unlike me, Julie is a regular kid. As the years went by, I became more withdrawn, but Julie just got cuter and more charming. It was clear who everyone preferred. Our parents started to favor Julie over me. They would say, Julie is such a lovely girl, but Rachel seems to be a bit on the darker side. They noticed I had become less odd lately, but still thought I was different. What they called odd was me not talking about things only I could sense. It was my way of dealing with the world. I was tired of how this ability of mine was torturing me, so I tried hard to suppress it. I wondered if my attempts to hide myself and appear normal were making me seem abnormal, or if once labeled as the odd kid, that image just couldn't be erased. I grew up without much love from my parents. On the other hand, Julie received all the love, including what should have been mine. Julie, who was spoiled and pampered, sensed our parents being cold and distant toward me. She started to look down on me. I don't like being around you. Your gloominess rubs off on me. I'm so cute, but your loner image brings me down. Julie started to insult me whenever she got the chance. Our parents lightly scolded Julie, but they never seriously tried to correct her. When I was in 8th grade and Julie was in 5th grade, she was scouted by a talent agency on the street. I knew it. It's because I'm cute. They said I could even appear on TV, Julie said, pleased with herself. She started dreaming big, and our parents didn't seem entirely against it. You should calm down and think carefully. I sensed something shady about this. I spoke up, expressing the intuition that I had long suppressed because I didn't want Julie to get into trouble. Julie, who didn't know about my unique ability, said, What's your problem? 
Are you just jealous because you're not cute and nobody approached you? Don't say weird things and stop interfering with me. She seemed furious. Even my parents, who knew about my ability, either forgot about it or were too excited about Julie standing on the glamorous stage. They sided with Julie and criticized me. After that, I resolved to remain silent again. I told myself that there was nothing good in saying unnecessary things. One day, a student teacher came to my junior high school. He was a male college student who graduated from the school and wanted to be a physical education teacher. As he shared his dreams about education and gave a strong greeting, the teacher and students, especially the female students, were charmed. When he responded cheerfully to the girls' excited cheers, I sensed a dark aura from him. I had always vowed to hide my unique abilities, but seeing my classmates potentially in danger, I decided to break my self-imposed rule. I chose a teacher who seemed understanding and talked to her. I know this is sudden, but please believe me and help me, I said. The teacher was puzzled by my sudden request, but agreed to stake out a certain location after school, just as I asked. I didn't tell the teacher the details. I had no reason to think she would believe me, but the fact that she agreed to help without any explanation made me think she wasn't an ordinary person either. The next day, the school was in an uproar. The male student teacher was arrested for violating a public nuisance prevention ordinance. The location where the teacher staked out was near the girls' restroom. Within 10 minutes of starting the stakeout, the student teacher appeared, entered the girls' restroom, and installed a video camera. The teacher caught him in the act. Thanks to that, the female students were saved from being secretly filmed, and their dignity was protected. Meanwhile, my sister, who had joined the talent agency, was proudly telling everyone about it. But there were no real lessons or auditions. She only had to pay expensive membership and lesson fees. Then, suddenly, the agency closed down, leaving an empty shell. In short, my sister was scammed. She cried and screamed, directing her anger at me. It's all because you said weird things. My future is ruined, and it's all your fault. It didn't make any sense, but my sister seemed to truly believe it. Maybe that's the only way she could handle it. For me, it was a disaster and a nuisance. Our parents didn't say such unreasonable things, but their attitude became more distant toward me and more supportive of my sister. I ended up feeling lonely again, as the odd one out. I was happy that I could help everyone at school, but I was terrified that my actions would corner me. That's when I received a call from the teacher who had listened to my story, asking me to come to the staff room. Worried that I would be labeled as strange again, I opened the door to the teacher's staff room. You knew something like that was going to happen, didn't you? The teacher asked me in a low voice, without any preamble. Thinking there was no point in pretending, I gathered my courage and told the teacher about my mysterious power. I thought so. I know there are very few people like you, the teacher said. For the first time, someone showed understanding for my situation. The teacher said they knew someone with a power like mine, and that's why they could understand. Actually, that person is my aunt, and I've been listening to her stories for a long time. You must be worried about a lot of things because of your power. Maybe getting advice from someone who's been in your shoes will help clear your mind. Saying that, the teacher introduced me to the person. The person looked at me with kind eyes and said, It's natural to be worried, but you don't need to suffer. I was drawn to their gentle yet deep eyes that seemed to see through everything. The person's name was Hannah, and she had the same kind of power as me since she was a child. She had experienced a lot of struggles and hiding herself throughout her life. The stories from my senior who had gone through the same experiences helped me release my worries and doubts. From this day on, my interactions with Hannah began. I called Hannah my mentor, but she just gave a wry smile and said, please don't. Thanks to Hannah, or rather my mentor, I changed. I had been living my life quietly, trying to stay unnoticed, but as my awareness grew, I gradually began to live a normal life as an ordinary girl. However, 
since the incident with the talent agency, I haven't been able to reconcile with my sister. If anything, it feels like we're drifting apart. It's become normal for her not to talk to me, and when she does, it's just to complain or insult me for no reason. I often have no idea what triggers her mood switches. My power couldn't predict my sister's emotional changes either. Just because you got into college doesn't mean you're all that. It's not even that great of a school, and you're so happy-go-lucky, she would say. My sister, who had hoped to get into her top-choice high school, ended up at her second-choice school. Because of that, she got mad when I got into my first-choice college. It's not like I bragged to her, she just dissed me because of her own frustrations. Our parents only tried to appease my upset sister and kept their distance from me, as if telling me to stay away from her. It seemed that my sister didn't like the fact that I had become brighter since meeting my mentor. To my sister, I had to be a dark and gloomy girl who was inferior to her. But my sister is really smart. It was surprising that she failed her high school entrance exams. Of course, she was filled with frustration and poured all of that into studying at her new high school. As a result, she was at the top of her class for all four years and got accepted into a prestigious national university on her first try. I got into the most difficult university. Your college doesn't even come close to mine, she boasted. I lightly responded with, that's true to my satisfied sister because I knew nothing good would come from getting too involved with her. However, my sister thought that my light reaction was belittling her accomplishments and unleashed a barrage of verbal abuse at me. Both my parents were at their wit's end with my sister, who couldn't be calmed down once she lost her temper. All they could do was watch nervously. They blamed me for causing the trouble and eventually ended up calling me a troublemaker. I wanted to argue back about who the real problem child was, but I always swallowed my words to avoid complicating things further. Setting aside my sister's issues, as I approached college graduation, I had to seriously confront my own career path. I was no longer as introverted as I used to be. I still struggled with socializing and had little confidence in building good relationships with others. My ability allowed me to detect people's negative emotions. While I could sense positive emotions too, it seemed people were more prone to negative ones, which made detecting such negativity painful for me. Throughout my school life, I was tormented by these swirling negative emotions and had come close to losing faith in people. Could someone like me really manage to work at a company? I decided to consult my mentor about this dilemma. I wanted to learn how she had overcome similar issues as I was sure she had faced them as well. I have experienced the same worries as you. Maybe you should consider doing the kind of work I do, she suggested. My mentor used to work as a fortune teller and a counselor, helping people resolve their problems. She could use her abilities to their fullest extent and contribute to the world and people around her. Also, she was able to work freelance, which meant she didn't have to belong to any organization. This way, there were fewer chances of getting entangled in human relationships or being affected by other people's emotions. It's the perfect job for people like us, she said. Encouraged by my mentor, I decided to pursue the same line of work. She taught me everything from how to do the job to how to acquire clients. Nowadays, thanks to the internet, it's possible to work from home without any issues. When I told my parents and sister that I would not seek employment after graduation and work from home instead, they responded, What's that? What kind of job is that? Seems so dumb. You'll be home all the time. At least make sure to do the housework. Can you even make a living doing that? How will you cover living expenses? Well, as long as you contribute to the household, do whatever you want. While I expected such a response from my parents, it made me feel a little lonely that they didn't support me more. I felt sad thinking about their demands for housework and money. My mood darkened, and so my life working from home began. At first, I didn't have any job requests and struggled day by day. But with my mentor's help, I gradually got the hang of it and started to make a living. 
For about a year, I couldn't contribute financially to the household, so I focused on doing the housework. My dad seemed unsatisfied, but my mom was relieved and kept him in check. After about a year, when I finally started contributing financially, my dad mocked me by saying, Oh, finally, you're able to earn some pocket change, huh? But I could tell he was actually quite satisfied with the money. However, even though I was contributing, the amount of housework I had to do didn't decrease, and our lives remained unchanged. Then, after another three years, my sister graduated from college and secured a job at a foreign company. Unlike you, I'm an elite. You're just unemployed, living at the bottom of the barrel. It's so depressing to have you as a sister, she would say. My sister, who had successfully landed a job, started to belittle me for working from home. What are you even doing working from home? That's just like playing. You're nothing more than a parasite living at home. At times, she'd say, it's really weird not to work outside. I'm working hard, earning everyone's respect, and now I've been promoted to teen leader. My pay is going to increase, and I'm probably earning about five times more than you. There's no way a homedy like you can earn that much. My sister, who was promoted to teen leader after only a year and a half at the company, kept one-upping me and looking down on me. She boasted about her good salary, but hardly contributed any money to the household, and didn't help with the chores at all. Laundry, cleaning, preparing meals, everything was dumped onto mom and me. When I say mom and me, mom mostly left it to me, so I was basically doing everything. Whenever I said to her, Julie, you should take care of yourself a little. You shouldn't just spend all your money on fun. You should contribute to the household too. She just dismissed me, saying, you, the unemployed, can handle the chores. I'm saving my money for my future. Our parents also just let her do what she pleased for some inexplicable reason of, it's Julie, it can't be helped. I was used to my current lifestyle, and it was a comfortable environment for me to work, so I wanted to keep it that way. But I was starting to consider how to take care of myself. Then came the bombshell announcement from my sister. Without any prior warning, both our parents and I were taken aback as she continued. He's a real elite with an annual income. She sneered at me and added, Marriage is just a pipe dream for someone unemployed like you, isn't it? She said she would bring her boyfriend over the next Sunday. With the rapid succession of sudden developments, Sunday came, and we were still reeling. The man my sister brought along looked like a successful young man, impeccably dressed in a sharp suit. Nice to meet you. My name is Jack, he said. I would like to ask for your permission to marry Julie, Jack said, greeting us properly and showing good manners. Isn't he wonderful? Just as I said, I'm going to be so happy with this man, Julie gushed. So Jack, what do you do for a living? Dad managed to ask, clearly impressed by Jack's presence. Yes, I'm currently training at a company that my father knows, Jack replied. We were puzzled by the word training, and then Julie said gleefully, his father is the president. He's training now to take over the presidency in the future. My sister seemed over the moon about becoming a future president's wife. Afterward, we had various conversations, and Jack left stylishly. There were a few things that made me raise an eyebrow during the conversation, but my parents were thrilled with the high-status man. However, I felt an inexplicable dark shadow from that seemingly refreshing and good-natured man, Jack. It was something only I could sense, so I didn't know how to explain it. I could no longer remain silent, fearing that marrying a man with hidden issues would make my sister unhappy. Julie, you've only been dating him for less than four months. You might want to understand him a little more before deciding to get married, I cautioned, driven by a strong gut feeling. Sis, he's an elite and a future CEO. You won't find anyone better than him. Oh, I see, you're jealous, aren't you? You're bitter because you're comparing your life to my happy one. Poor jobless sis, she retorted. Even our parents got angry at me for interfering with Julie's happiness. You're just unemployed, 
so at the very least, stop interfering with your sister's happiness, they said. It was clear that our parents were hoping to secure a comfortable old age by marrying Julie off to a wealthy man. Frustrated by my inability to effectively communicate my concern about the dark shadow I sensed looming over Julie, my head was spinning. In the meantime, the two got engaged, and a meeting between both families took place. Jack's parents, like him, carried an air of freshness about them, but I felt the same ominous cloud hidden behind them. However, I was unable to convey this danger to my overjoyed sister and parents. Before I knew it, the day of the wedding had arrived. The CEO of our company is attending today's reception. Can you comprehend how much I'm appreciated and anticipated in my company? I guess it's a kind of honor that a shut-in like you wouldn't understand, my sister said gleefully before leaving the house. She always included some derogatory words directed at me. At the wedding ceremony held at a hotel, the couple who pledged eternal love to each other entered the reception hall. Watching my sister, who was beaming with joy, I worried about how long this happiness would last. As my sister mentioned, the CEO made a keynote speech, full of praise for her, which delighted her. Once the speeches were over, food and drinks were served to each table. There were all sorts of delicious-looking dishes, but I started to feel a sense of discomfort. Gradually, I realized that no dishes were being served in front of me. At first, I thought my meal was just late, but other tables were already being served drinks, appetizers, and so on, one after another. Clearly, something was off. Nothing was being delivered to me. People at the same table began to notice this oddity and started whispering among themselves. At that moment, my sister came over to me and whispered into my ear with laughter in her voice. We didn't prepare free meals for the unemployed. After all, it's such a waste to serve such food to a jobless person. You should just eat potato chips at home. Just leave your gift money and go home. This outrageous remark was spoken loudly in my ear, and my ears rang. Jack, sitting at the groom's table, was grinning and nodding. Even our parents, who at first seemed surprised, said, well, it's true, Rachel is jobless after all. I was first taken aback, then a wave of anger surged up within me. I never thought you'd stoop this low, sis. Mom and Dad, this is unacceptable. How could you accept such rudeness? My parents just scowled at me, never bothering to reprimand my sister. Fine, I get it. I'm leaving, but don't come crying to me later, I said. You sound like a sore loser, she shot back. Amidst the chaos of this unbelievable turn of events, a man suddenly stood up. Sorry to interrupt, I'm the groom's brother, Larry. My brother and parents are trash, but it seems the bride is even worse. I can't take it anymore, said the man who introduced himself as Larry. He continued, Dad, your company went bankrupt five months ago, didn't it? Pretending to still be a CEO is just a scheme to mooch off the bride and her family. Jack will never become a CEO. He's planning to leech off his wife while pretending otherwise. He's unemployed now. Larry's words caused a commotion among the guests, but my sister was the most heated. What do you mean you lied to me? What do you mean unemployed? She demanded, her face turning from red to blue, her eyes welling up with tears. Our parents, their assumptions proven wrong, began to yell and curse. The anguished cries of my family echoed throughout the venue. The groom and his parents remained silent, looking sulky. Before the ceremony, I had received a confession and apology from Larry and asked him to speak his mind without reservation if something happened during the reception. As my sister was berating Jack with a wrathful face, Another man couldn't take it anymore and stood up. It was the president of my sister's company. Enough already. This is embarrassing. You have no right to criticize the groom. What do you think about your terrible attitude towards your own sister? The president's angry voice made my sister's face contort in fear. For one, I didn't attend your wedding for your sake. I wouldn't have come if you weren't the sister of Rachel. 
Suddenly, my name was mentioned by the president, and my sister's eyes widened in surprise. Huh? Who are you talking about? Rachel is a goddess to many of us business owners, rescuing countless companies from the brink of collapse, he continued. In fact, with the guidance of my mentor, I have been working as an advisor for corporate revitalization and growth. Starting with fortune-telling and life consultation, I used my abilities to show companies the path they should take. All my advice was spot on, and the companies that sought my help experienced a rapid resurgence in business, achieving a V-shaped recovery. As a result, I had earned titles like teacher and goddess. My sister's company had also consulted with me five months ago, and thanks to my advice, it had been reborn as a stronger enterprise. The president, grateful for my assistance, attended the wedding today as well. I had no idea. You're not just a basement-dwelling unemployed nobody, are you? My sister said, finally realizing the truth. Thanks to my thriving career, her assumptions had been shattered. I now earn several times what you do. Despite contributing significantly to the household income, our parents never seemed to care about me. They thought that money was from Julie. Oh, we thought July provided that money. They said, misunderstanding the situation. There was no way Julie would have been contributing money to the house. The wedding reception turned into a chaotic scene and was called off. Naturally, all the guests were fully refunded their wedding gifts. I've already signed a contract for an apartment under my name. I can't afford it on my own, especially now that he's unemployed, my sister sobbed. Jack retorted, you're the one who signed the contract. I don't know anything about that. The wedding was a complete disaster, resulting from my sister's malice towards others. She may argue there were reasons for her behavior, but they didn't hold up. Afterward, Julie divorced Jack and claimed alimony. Since Jack was jobless and his parents didn't have much, she couldn't receive much alimony. She barely managed to pay for the wedding venue, let alone the apartment she had contracted. The place that was supposed to be their love nest was never occupied and was cancelled. However, the debt didn't simply vanish and Julie found herself heavily burdened by loans. Moreover, her outrageous behavior at the wedding quickly became known among her colleagues, leading to a rapid decline in her reputation. The CEO had no choice but to demote her. With no place left in the company and having lost her pride as an elite, Julie wanted to quit and run away, but she had to bear the embarrassment for the sake of loan repayment. She continued with a trivial job in a hardly noticeable basement storage room. Jack and his parents, who had failed in their plan to leech off Julie, were now scraping by with occasional day labor. Naturally, Jack's elder brother, Gary, had cut off all ties with his parents and brother. The parents quickly gave up on Julie when she hit rock bottom and tried to cozy up to me instead. To them, I said, I've had enough of being manipulated by you. I'm cutting ties. Goodbye forever. I declared this and moved out to start a new life in a newly rented apartment. They took in the fallen Julie, who was struggling to make ends meet. Julie's salary was drastically reduced, and she couldn't possibly contribute to the household expenses, of course. I stopped the money I was contributing to the house as well. Without my financial help and unable to lower their standard of living, our parents quickly became exhausted and struggled every day to make ends meet. They were panting and stressed, trying to maintain the lifestyle they had grown used to, but without the necessary income, it became a daily challenge. On the other hand, my work was thriving. I was able to guide many companies and individuals in the right direction, using my abilities to help them succeed. My reputation grew, and more clients sought my advice. This success brought me a sense of fulfillment and financial stability. It felt good to finally be appreciated for my skills and to see the positive impact I was making on others' lives. After the wedding incident, I started dating Larry. He had been so honest and brave during that chaotic time, and we grew close. He recently proposed to me, and I accepted. If everything goes well, marriage could be in our future. 
Larry is a man of pure heart with no dark shadows lurking within him. Unlike the people my sister had surrounded herself with, Larry was genuine and kind. I'm looking forward to building a happy life with Larry. Together, we dream of a future filled with love, mutual respect, and understanding. With him by my side, I feel a sense of hope and excitement for what lies ahead. We've talked about our plans, our dreams, and how we want to support each other in everything we do. As I reflect on everything that has happened, I feel a mix of emotions. I am relieved to have cut ties with my parents and sister, who never appreciated me. I am proud of the person I have become, despite the challenges I faced, and I am grateful for Larry, who has brought light and love into my life. Looking forward, I see a bright future. I am excited about the possibility of marriage with Larry and the life we will build together. With him, I know I will never have to hide who I am or feel unappreciated. Our love and partnership are based on honesty and mutual support, and I can't wait to see what the future holds for us. Hi there, I'm Laura. I'm 27 years old, and I recently found myself navigating life as a newly divorced woman after separating from my husband, Larry. Our love story began back in college, where we shared classes and quickly fell in love. We had a strong bond, but there was always a shadow over our relationship Larry's mother, Lily. From the very beginning, Lily seemed to harbor an inexplicable dislike for me. She was always meddling in our relationship, offering unsolicited advice, and making me feel unwelcome. I expressed my concerns to Larry many times, but he struggled to confront his mother. He was torn between his loyalty to her and his love for me. Eventually, I resigned myself to endure Lily's criticisms, believing that Larry might have been unknowingly sharing too much with her, giving her fuel to criticize me. Our relationship faced many challenges, with frequent arguments about his mother's influence. But over time, Larry began to understand my perspective and stopped sharing the intimate details of our life with her. After five years of dating, we got married, much to Lily's dismay. Despite her attempts to interfere with our marriage, we managed to distance ourselves from her toxic presence for a while. During this period, both Larry and I found success in our careers. Although I admired Larry's accomplishments, I started to feel the need for something more personal, something that was mine alone. We had split our expenses unequally, with me covering the majority, but that didn't bother me much. What really weighed on me was the growing void I felt inside, a desire to pursue something creative and fulfilling. Drawing on my passion for design, I decided to explore graphic design as a side venture. It became a personal project, something I could call my own, and I kept it under wraps for a while, nurturing it quietly as I figured out where it might take me. I decided to take a leap of faith and enrolled in graphic design courses, investing in equipment without Larry's knowledge. My best friend Mary was the only person I confided in about this new venture. She was incredibly supportive, offering me both encouragement and practical advice as I developed my skills. As my confidence grew, Mary introduced me to people who were interested in hiring me, even though I was just starting out. They appreciated my work and trusted me with their projects, helping me gradually build a client base. This new source of income made a big difference in our lives. It eased the financial pressures we were facing and allowed Larry and me to enjoy a more comfortable lifestyle. With each paycheck, I saved a portion, dreaming of surprising Larry with something special as a token of my appreciation for his support. However, I hadn't mentioned any of this to him yet. And every time I thought about bringing it up, it seemed like he was avoiding serious conversations. It wasn't long before I noticed something was off. Larry became increasingly distant, and I couldn't shake the feeling that he was hiding something from me. The first real sign of trouble came when Larry admitted that he had spent his entire paycheck on investments just a week after receiving it. We had a heated argument about it but we managed to patch things up for the time being. To help make ends meet, I put in extra hours at work, which helped relieve some of the financial strain. 
but the following month, Larry repeated the same behavior, and I found myself feeling more and more frustrated. I couldn't understand how he could be so careless with his earnings, especially when I was working so hard to contribute to our household. In a moment of anger, I lashed out with hurtful words, though I quickly regretted my outburst. However, when Larry once again found himself without money for the fifth month in a row, I reached my breaking point. I had been meticulously managing our finances, working tirelessly not just at my day job, but also on my growing graphic design business, which was becoming our main source of income. It was becoming clear that something had to change, and I couldn't keep carrying the burden alone. I had reached my limit. How could you let this happen again? Have you learned nothing? I scolded Larry, my frustration boiling over. Despite his attempts to justify his actions, I was done bearing the weight of his financial irresponsibility. It was a tough decision, but I made it clear that I wasn't going to bail him out this time. Larry reacted with indignation and defensiveness, but I stood firm. You can't gamble away your entire paycheck and expect me to cover for you, I asserted. I won't enable this behavior any longer. Our argument quickly escalated, with accusations flying back and forth, until finally, Larry stormed out, leaving me alone to grapple with the turmoil of our crumbling relationship. In the aftermath of our confrontation, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to Larry's behavior than met the eye. Suspicions began to creep in, and I wondered if Lily, his overbearing mother, might be involved. Determined to uncover the truth, I decided to do some investigating while Larry was out. It didn't take long for me to find what I was looking for. Larry had carelessly left his bank account logged in on my laptop, and what I discovered shocked me. Contrary to his claims of being broke, Larry had more than enough money squirreled away. As I scrutinized his transactions, I found nothing unusual, just the usual debits and credits. But I couldn't understand why he had been hiding his finances from me and telling lies. Seeking clarity, I delved into his messages, and the first person I noticed him texting was his mother, Lily. Their conversation revolved around our recent altercation, with Larry painting me as the antagonist, claiming I had berated him for withholding money. Lily seemed to revel in the discord, affirming her suspicions about me. As I scrolled further, I uncovered a disturbing revelation. Lily had been relentlessly disparaging me to Larry, labeling me as materialistic, and insinuating that I was only with him for financial gain. Ironically, I was the primary breadwinner in our household. Their exchanges showed how Lily's toxic influence had fueled Larry's grievances against me, magnifying minor annoyances and nurturing his resentment. The final blow came when I realized just how deeply Lily's words had seeped into Larry's mind, twisting his perception of our relationship and turning him against me. The truth was out, and it left me reeling. When I discovered their scheme to cut me off financially, it felt like the ground had been ripped out from under me. Initially hesitant, Larry gradually gave in to Lily's manipulations, slowly yielding to her demands. He unknowingly provided her with more ammunition by sharing moments where I had expressed my frustrations, further fueling her animosity toward me. This betrayal was devastating, leaving me overwhelmed with hurt and confusion. Unsure of my next steps, I turned to my best friend, Mary, seeking solace in her comforting presence. I confided in her, revealing the distressing truth I had uncovered and desperately seeking her guidance in this tumultuous moment. Mary, ever the steadfast confident, listened intently, offering her unwavering support as I struggled to process the betrayal inflicted by those closest to me. The situation weighed heavily on me, and I found myself at a crossroads, uncertain of the best course of action. It seemed glaringly obvious cut off Larry's support, wait for him to hit rock bottom, and then file for divorce. But Mary questioned the morality of such a plan, suggesting that it might be too harsh. Her concern prompted me to reconsider my approach, and she advised me to sleep on it and revisit the issue the next day. Exhausted both physically and emotionally, I welcomed the respite that sleep promised. 
The next morning, with the luxury of a weekend ahead, Mary and I decided to find comfort in the familiarity of a favorite movie. We drifted off to sleep in each other's company, the tranquility of the day offering a temporary sense of peace, a brief reprieve from the turmoil brewing within me. We indulged in simple pleasures, immersing ourselves in movies, enjoying culinary delights, and savoring each other's company. Despite the nagging thoughts of the previous day's revelations, I made a conscious effort to set them aside, prioritizing the much-needed break from the stress and heartache I had been experiencing. However, our peaceful reprieve was short-lived. A call from Lily shattered the calm. Reluctantly, I answered, only to be met with accusations and hostility. Her unwarranted attacks only served to heighten the tension, but with Mary's encouragement, I managed to maintain my composure amidst Lily's tirade. Then, amidst the hostility, an unexpected proposal emerged a 40 sixtieths split of everything between Larry and me. It was a proposition that dripped with skepticism, clearly a test of my commitment to the marriage. Despite the audacity of her demand, it left me contemplating the next steps in what was becoming an increasingly difficult and painful situation. I agreed, willing to explore any possibility of salvaging what was left of our relationship. With a tentative acceptance, we set plans in motion, culminating in a scheduled meeting on Friday to formalize the arrangement. Despite the lingering uncertainty, I resolved to face the challenge head-on, armed with newfound determination to navigate the tumultuous waters ahead. I was stunned by the turn my marriage had taken, caught between disbelief and seething anger. How could Lily brand me a gold digger? And how could Larry stand by and allow such an accusation? I had stood by him through thick and thin, supporting his endeavors even when they led to losses. I had covered for him when he lied and shouldered the burden of our shared responsibilities, all while keeping my own side hustle a secret, waiting for the right moment to reveal it. When I shared the details with Mary, her smile hinted at the brilliance of the plan. Splitting everything evenly would leave Larry with little to fall back on, given his lack of awareness about my additional income. I had initially hoped to surprise him with a lavish gift once my side venture gained traction, but now I was simply grateful to have it as a safety net. Friday arrived quickly, and Mary accompanied me for support. When we arrived home, we found Lily, Larry, and a lawyer already there, finalizing the contract. Ignoring Larry's silent plea for privacy, I approached Lily and demanded to review the terms. As expected, the agreement mandated an equal division of assets, with a clause prohibiting financial assistance between us. Reluctantly, I signed, knowing it would leave Larry scrambling financially. Predictably, problems ensued. Initially, our communication was limited to curt words, the rift between us too deep to bridge. Yet, living under the same roof required some level of interaction. Larry attempted to reach out and mend the divide, but I remained distant, resentful of his complacency in the situation. As time passed, Larry's persistent attempts to reconnect grew tiresome. The weight of our fractured relationship hung heavily over us, and I found it increasingly difficult to maintain my resolve. Despite everything, the reality of our situation was sinking in and I knew that the path forward would not be easy. I eventually gave in. Will you please just talk to me? We can't keep going on like this. Larry pleaded, his voice filled with a longing that caught me off guard. It was jarring to hear him express how much he missed our connection, especially after he had willingly signed away our financial unity. What do you want me to say, Larry? I retorted, my frustration clear. Is that why you agreed to sever our finances completely? His silence was deafening, revealing the deep divide between us as we stood at the brink of our shattered marriage. I struggled with the weight of our choices, unsure if reconciliation was even possible. I just need to know where your loyalty lies, Laura, Larry implored. Despite all the issues caused by your mother, you still choose to side with her. Is this truly what you believe is best for us? Please, Larry, don't speak ill of my mother like that. 
And what wealth are you so concerned about? I don't understand, I countered, feeling both confused and hurt. I'm simply trying to make things right between us. Can we not lash out at each other? There will be no reconciliation until that contract is null and void, Larry replied defensively. It's only been three weeks since we signed it, and I've seen no evidence to suggest you're not here for the money. If you're struggling financially, just let me know. I'm willing to help, I offered, trying to bridge the gap between us. Wouldn't that be a breach of the contract? I won't risk violating it, I insisted. Why are you making this so difficult? Can't we just be civil? I could see Larry wrestling with conflicting influences his mother's and his own. The Larry I married wouldn't have succumbed to such manipulation. That month, I focused on paying off our major debts, leaving Larry to manage on his own. With my share settled, I had more disposable income, and Mary and I indulged in lavish outings, while Larry always had an excuse for his financial constraints. My graphic design side gig was thriving, and I began to seriously consider quitting my day job. Meanwhile, Larry struggled, his portion of the pantry often bare. While a part of me felt sympathy for him, I couldn't ignore the choices he had made that led us here. I reminded myself that Larry had brought this situation upon himself, but that didn't make the unfolding events any easier to handle. Lily's unexpected visit, however, threw me off balance. She stormed into my home, her face a mask of anger, and before I could even greet her, she accused me of stealing from Larry. The words hit me like a slap in the face. Not only was I confused, but I was also immediately on the defensive. How could she possibly think I was stealing from my own husband? What are you talking about? I demanded, trying to keep my voice steady. You're accusing me of seeking revenge on Larry, because I don't like the contract he made us sign? That's absurd. Your son has been struggling all month, but it's not because I've been stealing his money to fund my outings. He has no money to steal, and you know it. And let's not forget who actually coerced us into signing that contract in the first place. You forced it upon us, and now your son is paying the price. Lily's eyes narrowed, and I could see her temper flaring. Liar, she shouted. I'm calling the police right now. Go ahead, I replied, meeting her gaze head on. I haven't taken a single cent from your son. You won't find anything because there's nothing to find. Then how do you have so much money? She demanded, not backing down. Your job doesn't pay that much more than Larry's, and he's told me you've cut back your hours. So where's all this money coming from? I took a deep breath, deciding that now was the time to lay it all out. I have another business on the side. I began. A graphic design venture that I've been working on for a while now. I was planning to surprise Larry with it, to show him what I'd accomplished. But thanks to your constant meddling, that plan went down the drain. I was even going to use the money to buy you a car as a gesture of goodwill, to show you that I'm not the person you think I am. Lily looked taken aback, but she wasn't ready to relent just yet. How much do you make from this side business? She asked, her voice laced with suspicion. More than you'd expect, I answered. I've worked hard to build something successful, something I'm proud of. And all this time, I wasn't lying or trying to deceive anyone. I was simply trying to do something good, something positive. And now, thanks to your interference, everything I've worked for has been jeopardized. If you care so much about your son, maybe you should be the one supporting him instead of tearing down everything I've built. With that, I took a deep breath and reached into my bag pulling out a set of divorce papers that I had been holding onto for this moment. The sight of them seemed to take Lily by surprise, but I was beyond caring about her reaction. I turned to Larry, who had been standing silently by, his expression a mix of guilt and resignation. I didn't want it to come to this, Larry, I said, my voice softening as I addressed him. I tried to make things work, even after everything that's happened, but I can't keep doing this. I can't keep living under the shadow of your mother's influence, and I can't keep pretending that everything is okay when it's not. I've worked hard to build a life for myself, 
and I deserve to be with someone who supports that, not someone who lets their mother tear us apart. Larry looked down, unable to meet my eyes. Lily opened her mouth to say something, but I cut her off before she could start. This isn't just about money, I continued. It's about respect, trust, and the foundation of a relationship that should have been built on mutual support. I've done everything I can to support you, Larry, even when things were tough. But I need to take care of myself now, I need to protect what I've built. With those words, I handed the divorce papers to Larry. The silence that followed was heavy, filled with the weight of everything that had led us to this point. Lily looked at the papers, then at Larry, her face a mask of disbelief. I knew it wasn't going to be easy, and the road ahead would be filled with challenges. But I also knew that I couldn't keep sacrificing my own happiness and well-being for the sake of a relationship that was no longer healthy. As I turned to leave, I felt a sense of finality, but also a sense of relief. I had taken the steps I needed to protect myself, and now it was time to move forward. Whatever the future held, I was ready to face it on my own terms, with the knowledge that I had done everything I could to make things right. I had filed for divorce right after we signed the contract, quietly holding on to the papers until the right moment to reveal them. When I finally handed them to Larry, the shock on his face was unmistakable, but I felt no sympathy. I had given him every chance to make things right, and he had chosen his path. I expected Lily to be pleased, given how hard she had pushed for this separation. Instead, her expression shifted to one of fury as she realized the full consequences this would have for her son. I calmly informed them that I would be moving out in last weeks. I had made up my mind, and there was no going back. I agreed to continue splitting the remaining loan payments, but that was the extent of my commitment. Larry, clearly desperate, tried to plead with me, hoping to change my mind, but I remained resolute. I reminded him that this was the outcome of his choices and actions, and that we had both reached a point of no return. In the months that followed, I began to feel a sense of liberation from the toxic relationship that had been weighing me down for so long. Lily, as expected, tried to contest the divorce, likely hoping to salvage something from the situation. However, with our assets already legally separated, there was little for Larry to gain from the proceedings. In fact, he ended up losing more than he ever imagined. Unable to keep up with the mortgage payments on the house, he was forced to sell it and move back in with his mother. As for me, my life took a turn for the better. My graphic design business began to flourish far beyond what I had initially envisioned. I started landing lucrative opportunities with big brands, and my client base expanded rapidly. It was a blissful and rewarding period for me, one that filled me with a sense of accomplishment and relief. I finally felt like I was in control of my life, free from the negativity and constant stress that had overshadowed my marriage. Every day, I felt grateful that I had something to fall back on. My side business, which had started as a small venture, had grown into a successful and profitable enterprise. This financial independence spared me from the fate Larry had to endure, and it allowed me to move forward without the burden of our past weighing me down. Larry's situation was quite different. With the house sold and his financial stability shattered, he struggled to adjust. Moving back in with his mother was a blow to his pride, and I could only hope that this experience would serve as a lesson for him in the future. Perhaps he would learn the importance of responsibility, trust, and the consequences of allowing others to manipulate his decisions. But those lessons were no longer my concern. I was focused on building my own future now. I embraced the opportunities that lay ahead, excited about what was to come. The freedom to pursue my passions, the success of my business, and the peace that came with leaving a toxic situation behind filled me with a sense of fulfillment I hadn't felt in years. Life was finally moving in a positive direction, and I was determined to make the most of it. I surrounded myself with supportive friends, like Mary, who had stood by me through thick and thin. Together, we celebrated the small victories and the big achievements, 
knowing that this new chapter in my life was just the beginning. Looking back, I realized how far I had come and how much I had grown. The painful experiences of the past had shaped me into a stronger, more resilient person. I was no longer the woman who had been manipulated and overshadowed by others. I was now someone who knew her worth, who understood the value of independence, and who was ready to take on the world with confidence. The future was bright, and I was ready to face it with open arms. No longer burdened by the mistakes and betrayals of the past, I was free to pursue my dreams and live life on my own terms. And that, more than anything, was the most rewarding part of this entire journey. I have a new girlfriend, and I'm going to live with her. I'm divorcing you, and you need to go to your parents. I don't understand what you're saying. I don't need you anymore. You can stay with my parents if you want to be a breadwinner or a housekeeper. Julianne, you understand, my in-laws and my husband laugh at me. They are the worst kind of people. But for me, it's better this way, so you all need to leave. My name is Julianne, and I am a 35-year-old office worker. I have spent my whole life working. After graduating from college, I started working for a major company. For about 13 years, I worked hard and earned qualifications for promotions. Thanks to that, I am now a department manager at a young age. I am blessed with a boss who always has something useful to say and a team of highly motivated and talented subordinates. My work life was very fulfilling, but my personal life was not at all. I had a boyfriend once when I was a student, but none since I started working. Worried about my situation, a friend of mine hosted a dinner party for me. That is where I met Jake. He was kind, had a nice smile, and seemed very personable. Since he was the same age as me, we had a lot in common and enjoyed talking to each other. We soon became friends, exchanged contact information, and started going out to eat alone together. Then he confessed his feelings for me, and we started dating. We got along well, he proposed to me, and we ended up getting married. I was so happy to be married to the man I loved so much. Soon after, I went to his parents' house to meet them. His parents were very kind and welcomed me with open arms. Julian, it's nice to meet you. I can't believe such a beautiful person became Jake's bride, they cried. I am so proud of my son for bringing a good woman here. Hey mom and dad, stop it. Julian is getting scared. Oh my, if you really think so, you can say it. That's right, it's a compliment, so it's okay. His parents were very friendly and easy to talk to, just like him. Julianne works for a major company, doesn't she? Oh, that's great. It's cool to be a woman who can work hard. Will you quit your job when you get married? No, I'm going to keep working. Well, you've got a good job at a good company. That's better. I was relieved. According to my friends, their mothers-in-law often told them to quit their jobs saying it was a wife's job to support her husband. So I was glad. I thought to myself that my future mother-in-law was generous. After greeting my parents, we got married. My heart was filled with excitement for the new married life that was about to begin. My husband moved into the house I was living in, and we started our new life together. I was very happy to be newlyweds with my husband, whom I loved very much. I was happy to be at home with him all the time and to have him home when I came back from work. Eight months into our life together, my husband said he had something he wanted to discuss with me. If you don't mind, I'd like you to live with my father and mother. What do you mean, live together? Yes, they are getting old, and I am worried about many things. I see, I can certainly understand how my husband feels. My parents are about the same age as my husband's parents, but my brother and his wife are currently living with them, so I have nothing to worry about. However, my husband is an only child, so it is understandable that he is concerned about his parents. Does this mean we are living with my in-laws? Yes, it would. But do they have a room available for us? They use every room for some reason or another. About that, if you like, I think it would be a good idea to renovate my parents' house and make it a two-family house. 
two families. Yes, if we do that, it will be much cheaper than buying a new house. We can live in a beautiful and spacious house while still maintaining our privacy, right? I see, I thought, it was an attractive idea. My in-laws are kind people, and if we live in two houses, it won't be as stressful. Yes, that's fine. Really? Thank you. My mom and dad will be so happy. I was happy to see my husband so happy. Later, my in-laws came to visit us, and both of them were very grateful. I even thought that with such a kind and cheerful family, I wouldn't mind not having two households. Soon after, my husband and I discussed remodeling my in-laws' house. The cost would be around $200,000. As we were discussing it, my husband made a surprising remark. Actually, I have a favor to ask you. Can you pay for the remodeling? What do you mean, the full amount? Yes. Why? My husband looked very uncomfortable. Actually, we are in debt. I was shocked. Neither my husband nor my in-laws had ever mentioned this when we were dating or when we got married. How much debt do they have? About $250,000. What? I thought it would be a few tens of thousands of dollars, but I was surprised at the amount. I ended up shouting out loud. It wasn't so bad at first, but it gradually grew. Even if I tried to pay it back, I couldn't. My parents are already living on a pension, and the debt is getting bigger and bigger. I see. I couldn't hide my surprise and upset at the sudden revelation. I had no idea that my in-laws owed such a large sum of money. Julianne, I need a favor. Will you help me pay off my father and father-in-law's debt? They can't afford it anymore, and I don't make a very good salary either. Then isn't it going to be tough to renovate the house and live together as two families? No, that's important, so let's go ahead as planned. You have asked me to pay for the remodeling and your father's debt. I'm on the hook for a quarter of a million dollars. I know I'm talking about difficult things, but I want to take care of my life with you, Julianne, and I want to protect my mom and dad. It's because I love both my parents and you. I'm sorry I'm being greedy. But if you really love me, please help me. I'll pay you back little by little. I was very upset. My husband and my in-laws had no one to turn to but me. I knew my husband really loved me, but I felt deceived by his words. Love is blind, I thought. Okay, I'll pay for it, I agreed. My husband said, thank you so much, and shook my hand. He told my in-laws, and later they came to our house to apologize. My mother-in-law even cried tears of joy. I have to do my best from now on, I thought. I had to take over my in-law's debt and was determined to do it. Although I had some savings, I was afraid to pay it all at once, so I decided to pay $60,000 for my savings and then the rest in installments. My in-laws joined us to discuss the repayment. I explained my plan for installments, and they said I could do whatever I wanted. Why don't you transfer the money directly to the account for debt repayment? We're not very good at managing money, and I'm a little afraid to transfer a lot of money, my husband said. My in-laws nodded. It would be time-consuming for me to transfer the money to my in-laws' account, and then for them to transfer it to their repayment account. Since it was a large sum, I didn't want the money to get lost in the process. So, I agreed to transfer it directly. Once the conversation was settled, my in-laws looked very relieved. Now we don't have to be afraid of the monthly debt collection. It's been really scary. Dad and Mom, you should thank Julianne properly. Well, I can't tell you how many times I thanked you. I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much. I'm so glad Julianne became his wife. No, 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 I said. I was happy that my in-laws were happy. However, I felt a little uncomfortable because I thought they might see me as just a money source. Even though I felt a bit bad, I wanted to take care of my beloved husband's family. With that in mind, I began to make the payments, and we remodeled our house, making it a two-family home. We started living together in a beautiful and spacious house. 
My in-laws were very happy, and my husband's eyes lit up at the new house. I enjoyed cooking in the new kitchen and was glad we did the remodeling. It was more convenient and closer to work, which shortened my commute and gave me more free time. I could use that time to study. I worked hard every day to pay off the debt. However, something bothered me. My husband did not help pay off the debt at all. When I told him about my in-law's debt, he said he would help, but he never paid anything from his own paycheck. When I asked him about it, he said his salary was not enough. I asked to see his pay stubs, but he refused, so I didn't know how much he earned. I worked hard for about a year to pay off the debt. One day, my in-laws asked how much money was left to repay. If it's been a year, you haven't paid back that much, right? Well, we've paid back about $60,000 this year, so the remainder is roughly $180,000. My in-laws were extremely surprised. What? You paid back that much, Julianne? That's amazing. At this pace, you'll finish paying off the loan in about five years. If I work hard, I'll be able to pay it off, I replied. Thank you so much, my in-laws said, crying and happy. Seeing them so happy made all the hard work worth it. A few days later, I faced an unexpected situation. I had to work overtime, so I told my husband I would be home late. However, the work went smoothly and we finished on time. I hurried home, planning to cook dinner for my husband. When I opened the front door, I saw my in-law's shoes. Oh, my in-laws are here, I thought. I walked toward the living room and heard my in-laws and my husband talking. You were right to marry that woman, weren't you, Jake? You did great. I can't believe you got a woman with that much money when I heard she works for a big company. I was really careful and seduced her. You should be more grateful. You should be more grateful. Oh my, you're one of the people who created that debt. What? But I owe the least. What are you talking about? How much did you spend on horse racing? Your gambling is terrible. I get a jackpot once in a while, so sometimes we were actually ahead. How can you be ahead when you owe $250,000? But at this rate, we'll be able to get out of debt and get back on track. That's really great, and she even remodeled our house. I got a really good wife. Well, I'm going to dump her after she pays off the debt. My husband and in-laws laughed. I was so shocked I couldn't move from the front door for a while. After calming down a little, I made a loud noise as I closed the lock and said, I'm home, from the front door. When I went to the living room, my in-laws and husband greeted me with smiles. Oh, Julian, welcome home. Good job, good job. Well, we're going back to our room. Let's have dinner together again soon. I was so afraid of their gentle smiles because I had heard their earlier conversation. Seeing my husband pretending to be a good husband with a smile on his face shocked me. I wondered why I had been working so hard to pay them back. Didn't you say you had to work late today? Yeah, but I finished earlier than expected, so I hurried home to cook dinner. I tried my best to act calm until dinner so my husband wouldn't realize what I had heard. Later, when my husband was taking a bath, I stayed in my room and cried alone. Crying as hard as I could made me want to get back at my husband and in-laws. From then on, I acted quickly. I began to prepare for the divorce and made plans for what to do afterward. About five months passed. I pretended to be happy and told my husband that I had paid off my in-laws' debt. My husband's eyes widened. What? You paid off the debt? That $250,000? That was supposed to take roughly five years, right? Actually, I have quite a bit of money saved up, but I was afraid to pay it off all at once. So I started taking out a little bit from my salary and savings. But we were already below $200,000, and I thought it would be better to pay it all off at once. I see, I said. Then I asked, do you mind if I check? and showed my husband the bank book. Oh, it's true. $180,000 was paid all at once. My husband tried to hide his excitement, but I could see he was itching to get out of there. Wow, Julianne, thank you. 
my parents are going to love this. He put his hands on his face, pretending to cry, but I knew it was just an act. Soon after, my in-laws came and thanked me. Thank you so much. I'm so glad I met Julianne. You're like a blessing. If I hadn't known the truth, I would have been happy to hear their thanks. But I knew what they were really like, and I only acted nice because I was ready for my plan. A few days later, my husband asked to speak with me. He looked very serious. What's going on? I asked. I'm sorry, Julianne, but you have to leave me. What do you mean? I acted surprised on purpose. I have a new girlfriend. What? I'm going to live here with her, so I'm divorcing you. You're going to my parents' place. I was shocked by Jake's unexpected statement. I knew from overhearing their earlier conversation that my husband would leave me once the debt was paid, but I didn't expect him to openly declare his infidelity. What did he mean by sending me to his parents' place? I don't really understand what you mean, I said. My husband's mood turned sour. You're not very understanding at all. I don't need you anymore, but as a breadwinner or a housekeeper, I can keep you here. Then the front door opened and my in-laws came in. Jake, did you finally tell her? Yeah, I told her. I wish I could have been there for that moment. You can come to our house if you do the chores for us. Of course, we'll charge you rent. My in-laws and husband laughed at me. They were the worst people ever. All of you need to leave, I said. My in-laws rolled their eyes at my comment. What are you talking about? Have you forgotten? I can easily pay for the renovation myself. You changed the name of the house to mine, so I have the rights to this house. I could decide who lives here and who has to leave. My in-laws' faces turned pale at my comment. They finally remembered about the house title. I was really dumbfounded. I'm sorry, but you can't live here anymore. If we get divorced, you'll be strangers. My in-laws realized the seriousness of the situation, but my husband, not wanting to be outdone, retorted, but you took over our debt and paid it in full. You're the one losing money. If we had no debt, we could at least afford a new place to live. That's true. Thank you for letting us live in a nice house while you pay our debts, my in-laws and husband said. I'm sorry, but I didn't pay off the rest of the $180,000 debt. What? No, but you had money missing from your bank book. That was just a separate account I created and moved money around in. The debt hasn't changed from $180,000. I just haven't had the collections come yet because I've been paying large sums continuously. But it's time for them to come, so you are responsible for paying the rest. My husband and in-laws were shocked. Then I warned them, Jake, you told me you were having an affair, so you should pay alimony. I'll charge your partner for the affair too. Oh no, she went out with me because she thought I had money and a house. If I have to pay alimony, she'll dump me. I don't care about that. No, I apologize, please don't leave us, my husband pleaded. My husband was afraid of being dumped by his lover, and my in-laws were afraid of being left by me. They were truly selfish. I have nothing to do with you people anymore, no matter what you say. I have also put this house on the market. I will also have you pay the $120,000 debt I paid on your behalf through my lawyer. My in-laws froze, stunned by the loss of everything they had. I then demanded a divorce and alimony from my husband through my lawyer. I also demanded alimony from his lover and $120,000 from my in-laws for what I had paid. Actually, that renovated house sold for about $400,000. It was in a good location and a family looking for a duplex bought it at a good price. I had to pay $320,000, which included the $120,000 debt and $200,000 for the renovation. However, I ended up gaining $80,000 from selling the house. Additionally, I received alimony from my ex-husband and his affair partner, which greatly improved my financial situation. On top of that, I got a $120,000 payment from my ex-parents-in-law. I ended up benefiting the most from this situation. 
I believe this is fair because the damage I suffered was significant enough to make me distrust people. Initially, I had savings because I was learning how to invest, with the goal of paying off my in-laws' debts as quickly as possible. Since I had substantial savings to begin with, I invested tens of thousands of dollars, and my assets grew significantly in about a year. Additionally, I received a raise at work, so my earnings increased. Because of my savings and investments, I was able to take such drastic steps. My former in-laws ended up back in debt and lost their house, but they deserved it for deceiving me. People who cheat others should face the consequences. This experience has taught me to be more cautious and develop a better sense of judgment about people. Moving forward, I will continue to save and increase my assets so I can live a comfortable life in my old age. I want to make happy memories with people I can truly trust. For example, I started by focusing on improving my financial knowledge. I took courses and read books about investing and personal finance. This helped me make informed decisions about where to invest my money. Over time, I diversified my investments, spreading them across different asset classes like stocks, bonds, and real estate. This strategy helped grow my wealth steadily and securely. Furthermore, I took advantage of opportunities to advance my career. I sought out additional training and certifications related to my field. These efforts paid off when I received a significant promotion and raise. The increased income allowed me to save more and invest more aggressively. Through all of this, I remained focused on my long-term goals. I wanted to ensure that I could retire comfortably and enjoy my later years without financial worries. I'd also wanted to be in a position to help my loved ones if they ever needed support. This vision kept me motivated and disciplined. Eventually, my efforts paid off. I was able to buy a beautiful home in a great neighborhood. I also traveled to places I had always dreamed of visiting. More importantly, I built strong relationships with friends and family who truly cared about me. These connections brought me joy and fulfillment. Looking back, I realized that the challenges I faced with my ex-husband and in-laws taught me valuable lessons. They pushed me to become more self-reliant and financially savvy. They also helped me appreciate the importance of surrounding myself with trustworthy and supportive people. In conclusion, I transformed a difficult situation into an opportunity for growth. By focusing on my financial health and personal development, I created a better future for myself. I hope my story inspires others to take control of their lives and make positive changes. What did you think of the story? Please subscribe to our channel and see you in the next video.